It's time looking for ghosts again. What's up, Tom? Welcome to the Shadowcast. Greetings, uh, greetings. What are you guys up to? What's happening? A tip of the hat and a wave of the cane to all of you. Oh, and our ghost line is live tonight. If you guys want to call in, we'll be opening the line later on. We're talking about some weird stuff tonight, aren't we, Tom? And we have the lovely Cassie in the house. Hello, Cassie. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Terrifically. See anything weird lately? Any ghosts or anything? Not lately. Okay. <laughs> She's lying. Probably. <laughs> want to welcome everyone to the show. This is live Saturday night. We're just going to talk about a few things in roundtable fashion as we normally do. If you'd like to be a part of the show, you can uh, make your two cents known. Drop us a line in the live chat. We're paying attention to that. Also, our ghost line is live at 773. Six six nine six four five two. So as we uh, progress through the night, we're going to look at a couple of interesting, weird things. And we can say, huh, that's weird. I've never heard of that. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, we're going to go into some weird stuff tonight, aren't we, Tom? We gotta get Absolutely. Some, some good stuff. You got to get crazy out there. Tom, what do you think of, uh, what do you think of uh, uh, resisting the police? You think that's a good idea? Only if you have more guns than they do. Then I totally recommend it. If you have a machine gun, go for it. They will back down. Or if you're, a, or if you're, a, you know, an alien, that's that that helps too. Just blow up their car. Yeah. Shoot a laser. You know, really, when I think when people, um, I, I wonder, like when I watch cops, it's like, haven't people ever seen Rambo? It's like, that's how you take care of things. Nobody ever goes. Nobody ever does. That. Gotta have just tons of bullets wrapped around everywhere you got to jump on the back of the jeep and just start blasting away shoot you got to shoot before they start shooting that's the key well you see that's our plan rocket launcher. when the alien invasion happens that is that's our official plan uh so uh thanks tom tons just of weapons we were going to keep that completely secret but tom just let the whole plan out that when the aliens come that's that's what we're gonna use do. a rocket launcher we have to they are aliens and they do deserve it uh, tonight we're talking about something called the Gaffney Incident. Tom, what can you tell us off the top of your head about the Gaffney Incident? Uh, what What's this all about? Well, first of all, buckle in, all right? Because you're going to go on a wild ride tonight. And I want you to imagine that you are a police officer out on your nightly patrol. When all of a sudden start seeing strange lights in the sky but instead of hiding under your bed like Sherman the cat would do you decide to grab your gun jump in through the window Dukes of Hazard style and punch it up to a hundred you feel me this is some serious stuff guys Watch this. This is not a joke, Cassie. All right. November 17, 1966. Two police officers in South Carolina on a routine patrol happen upon a strange object that sets itself down on the road. They exit the vehicle to investigate. A strange figure appears in the entranceway of the craft. He stares at the two officers. What happened next Spacey. was almost lifted out of a science fiction magazine, except this was real. In 1966, rumors began to circulate around the town of Gaffney in South Carolina that two police officers had encountered a weird man who stepped out of a strange object. The bizarre incident appeared in a local living in newspaper, Northern California. and months later, it was briefly mentioned in the pages of Fate magazine. This prompted John Keel 
Fordian researcher and author of numerous best-selling paranormal-related books. Two, track down and interview one of the officers involved in the incident. Heal and his associate arrived at the Gaffney Police Station Tom, in our November audio? 1967. You bet, man. To the officer. Not surprisingly, Patrolman Charles Hutchins, the officer, mm. was reluctant to speak Good to Keel at him. first, as he had heard about how other officers who reported sightings of anomalous objects losing their jobs or being labeled a lunatic. Hutchins recalled the terrible fate of Dale Spar, an Ohio police officer who lost his job and suffered public shaming and other forms of unpleasantness after coming forward with his story of giving chase to a fast... I couldn't couple. suffer that unpleasantness. 1966. Keel assured Hutchins... Waved my handkerchief and surrender. Well, not unpleasantness. You know what happened. But he and his partner, one officer, A.G. Husky, encountered that November night. He wanted to hear it directly from Hutchins. The officer eventually obliged Mr. Keel and his associate and they adjourned to an empty room in the police station. Right away, Hutchins wanted to clear up something about the encounter that the newspaper had gotten wrong. Keel wrote of what Hutchins told him. The little man had not had a green complexion, as was reported in the newspapers. Little man. He and Officer A.G. Husky had first told their story. They had been subjected to so many jeers that they impishly added the green complexion. Actually, he admitted, the creature's face seemed rather ordinary and human-like, and neither man was able to tell whether his complexion was light or dark. At the time of the incident, Hutchins had only been with the Gaffney Police Force for about six months. Husky had served for five years. He claims the night was just like any other. They were doing their routine patrol. It was around 4 a.m. They were driving along the isolated and unpopulated road through an outlying section of Gaffney known as the West Buford Street Extension when, as I they love that extension. bend in the road, Usually West Buford. saw but a metallic the object area. directly in front of them. This object was descending when they first saw it. It was about 20 feet above the ground. Gaffney noted that it was spherical, like a ball, with a wide, flat rim around it. There were no lights or portholes visible on it. As the object settled to within a few feet of the ground, both officers, assuming it was some type of experimental aircraft having troubles, exited their car to investigate. Hutchins admitted to Keel they were in a state of shocked amazement. As they stared at the now landed craft, Hutchins estimated that it was about 20 feet in diameter. Just then, a small door suddenly opened silently on the underside of the sphere. A short ladder, four to six feet long, dropped to the ground. A white light was pouring out of the opening. It was so bright that neither officer could see anything in the interior. Soon a figure appeared in the doorway. After staring at the officers, it began to slowly descend the ladder. Upon reaching the ground, it walked slowly and deliberately toward the two police officers. The breath of life when it got to about 15 to 20 feet from the officers, it stopped. Hutchins claimed that this man was short, about four feet tall, about the size of a 12-year-old boy. He wore no helmet or headgear and was dressed in a gold suit with no buttons or zippers. His outfit was shiny, like metal, in the reflection of the headlights. It was not self-luminous. Hutchins, for some reason, could not remember seeing the feet of the creature. It was standing in high grass, and the feet must have been hidden, he guessed. He moved just like anybody else, but kind of slow like he was taking his time. He wasn't scared of us or anything like that, Hutchins told Keel. That said, Hutchins acknowledged that both he and his partner knew that something wasn't right about the situation, and they were both frightened. We were both kind of shaky and scared, he admitted to Keel. When asked about what happened next, Hutchins informed him that they began to speak to the strange man. He did most of the talking. When we asked questions, he wouldn't answer us, but just went right on talking. For some reason, Hutchins actually had trouble remembering the full context of the conversation. He could only recall certain snippets of the chat, noting that the being spoke well, like a college graduate. He also did not have an accent. He acted like he knew exactly what he was saying and doing. He didn't make any quick moves or false moves. He just stood there and talked to us. Officer Hutchins recalled that he stammered out a question, something like, What are you doing here? 
The being did not answer, but instead asked a question of his own. He wanted to know why we were both dressed alike. So I guess we told him we were police officers. His speech was very, very precise. He pronounced each word very carefully. I can't remember everything he said now, but it wasn't anything very important. I asked him where he was from, but he didn't answer. He just laughed. He had a funny kind of laugh. The confrontation was brief, perhaps only two or three minutes. Then, Hutchins said, the being announced, I will return in two days. At that point, the being turned around, walked slowly back to the ladder, and climbed into the object. The door closed quietly, and the craft began to whir. It wasn't like those whirring sounds in science fiction movies. There was no screeching to it. It was soft, like an engine with a muffler on it. The two officers watched in amazement as the object rose slowly up and vanished into the night sky. They stood there for a few minutes in stunned silence before they finally pulled themselves together and returned to their cruiser. They headed back to the police station. The next day they went back to the site with a local councilman named Hill, where they found fresh footprints in the exact spot where the little man had stood. They looked like children's footprints, Hutchins remembered. Sadly, no casts were made. When speaking about talking to Hutchins, Hill recalled, Hutchins appeared to be a straightforward, honest witness. There were many details he could not remember, and it seemed he did not attempt to embellish his story at all. His reputation in Gaffney was excellent. Careful cross-examination failed to uncover any discrepancies in his narrative. Later, we spoke to A.G. Husky on the phone. We did not meet him. He confirmed Hutchins' story, but said he wanted to forget the whole thing. He had left the force and now operates his own business in Gaffney, a town of about 10,000. Neither Hutchins nor Husky had read any UFO literature before the incident, nor do they seem very interested in such literature now. And that's why you should always shoot first, ask questions later, whenever you encounter aliens. Always wear a suicide vest. Have the button ready. Wear a dynamite vest. I just think it's interesting that these stories where something people believe something happened they believe they've had an encounter but they don't really make a whole lot of sense to me and that's one of these stories that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me Tom how so Jay well it's very vague the aliens just kind of laugh them off when they ask what they're doing <laughs> could you be presupposing that aliens make sense or what makes sense to them is the same stuff that would make sense to us. Or that it's not all just a joke to them. You think it's a joke to them? You think they think this is funny? You know, what I'm noticing, Jay, is a great number of similarities between this incident and the one we reviewed in episode three. The Zimbabwe UFO landing. You have a similar sized craft that landed also in a brushy area. Brushy, grassy area. And a little man came out on a ladder or platform, as the children called it. I also noticed that this little man was described as moving unusually slowly which is something the children also said that it was like he was it's like he was running but going slow at the same time they didn't know how to describe it and it sounded an awful lot like what this man was describing a little man with a very strange, slow way of walking, very deliberate. 
also that the being was child size, which is also what the African kids said, that the alien was the same size as them. And that what I was gathering from this was that the difficulty the officer had remembering the exact dialogue that transpired between them. Now remember, police officers, that's what they do. They keep records. They have their notepad. They write down everything people say, da 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 da, da. To me, it's astonishing that an officer was, was like, yeah, I met a guy that came out of a spaceship, but I can't really remember what he said. I'm trying to remember it, but... Um, it kind of reminded me again of the Zimbabwe incident in so much as that it seemed more like it was the sense of what the alien was feeling and thinking is what was transmuted to the person he was communicating with. And I'm even wondering if this wasn't a telepathic encounter because it sounded more like things the alien was thinking or feeling that were emoted to the officer. Because that didn't sound like a take me to your leader communication. It sounded more like just subliminal thoughts that would be in someone's head when you're talking to them saying, I'll come back in two days, or that's funny, ha ha. I think that maybe this little man did come back in two days. Maybe he was just on the other side of town. I'm sure he showed up somewhere. But this certainly wasn't the first or the last encounter that had many of the trademarks of these sorts. You know, of perhaps it is these guys because think about the locations they go to where they show up very randomly. Like if it was just for them, to, you know, to to to, to stop and uh, take a leak, to check the tires real quick. They could literally just land anywhere, you know, but they choose they choose streets and and populated areas to land in. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Like, what's their agenda? What well, also, Jay, I can't emphasize this enough. The little men that come in spaceships, the way they do things is their own way, and they are not worried about how it looks. They're not afraid of anyone. They're basically doing whatever they want, and they don't seem to have even a sense of self-awareness about it. It just seems like they are just flying by to the seat of their pants and doing whatever they feel like. What we're about to watch next deals with the potential base under Mount Everest. And Tom, tell us a little bit about this. Well, when you think of good old Mount Everest, you think of... Going skiing, maybe going hang gliding off the top. Here's what you never considered. Maybe it's UFO base. That is their headquarters. Well, it's time for a reality check. Places on Earth can claim to have a genuine otherworldly feel to it than Mount Everest in the Himalayas with a peak sitting at an altitude of 29,029 feet. It's the highest recorded point above sea level on the planet. And as such, has been the ambition of the most daring climbers in the world. That's a big boy. To having conquered it, since it was given its name by the Royal Geographical Society in 1865. For those brave enough to attempt it, they enter an environment wholly hostile to human beings. It was named after Ronald Everest. Minus 20 degrees centigrade. The never-ending threat of an avalanche, surviving a barren wasteland, and even having to bring oxygen tanks in order to breathe properly near the top. For these reasons, there have been nearly 300 deaths on the mountain as of the end of 2017, with many of the bodies of those who have died still unrecovered. But there is another side to this incredible feat of nature, one that is steeped in mysticism and the paranormal. The local Sherpa population, many of whom are often employed as guides or laborers for expeditions to the top, tell of stories of strange ape-like creatures that live on the side of Everest, the Yeti. 
Ghost sightings are also surprisingly common occurrences on Everest, with many witnesses claiming to have encountered the spirits of those who died attempting to reach the top. I bet. I bet. Most incidents are often dismissed as misidentification or a combination of exhaustion and lack of oxygen playing tricks on the mind. However, in 2018, the internet became a buzz with news of a UFO having been caught on camera from the Mount Everest base camp, where every year, hundreds of climbers set off on their attempt to conquer the mountain. The object was captured unbeknowingly by mountaineer and filmmaker David Brescius in 2012. Where did David he get that hat? Having tackled Mount Everest himself numerous times, including in 1996, when eight climbers were killed in a blizzard that struck the mountain. Brescia's was in the process of constructing a stunning he murdered them. photo of the mountain Probably. range Look at as part of a them. project on the effects of global climate change. This involved stitching together 477 separate images into a super high definition mosaic composition, on one of which is the strange object which can be viewed when zoomed into a specific point. It's a the story too. of the Everest UFO was picked up by the YouTube channel UFO Today, who, after uploading it on March the 24th, 2017, said the following. The object resembles a flying disc of some sort, and it's clearly there, since we can see its silhouette. Judging its height from Mount Everest, it's, like it's safe to say this object is flying way above the height where helicopters or drones would operate. We do not have any additional information on the object, but it's interesting to see it flying above one of the highest mountains in the world. The story went largely unnoticed beyond the channel's regular subscribers until it began to trickle through the mainstream media in February 2018, after which the image went viral as well as fueling conspiracy theories surrounding UFOs. In their video description, UFO Today even mentioned the theory that Mount Everest is home to an underground UFO base that has been repeated in some UFO circles for several years. Although it sounds hard to believe, the sighting was by no means the first to be made on Earth's tallest peak. In 1933, British climber Frank Smythe was making his first solo effort to reach the peak, when at approximately 28,100 feet up on Everest North Ridge, he observed two UFOs in the sky. Recalling the event later, he said, They strongly resembled kite balloons in shape but one possessed what appeared to be squat, underdeveloped wings, and the other a protuberance suggestive of a beak. Protuberance. Motionless, but seen slowly to pulsate, a pulsation incidentally much slower suggestive than my own. Suggestive of a beak. If that wasn't enough, Frank claimed that despite his solo effort, he believed some unknown being made its presence known to him as he climbed. He was so sure of the being's presence that he even took a slice of cake from his pocket to share with his companion. <laughs> Two had a similar experience. Oh, I just keep some cake in my pocket. Google Hastings That's just something I do. were nearing the top when they ran into trouble and had to settle into a snow cave they had constructed for the night while they pondered what to do. Both climbers reported that during the night, a presence made itself known to them inside the snow cave and as well as offering advice to them on how to survive, it also transmitted warmth to them in order to keep them alive. Supporters of the theory that a UFO base exists on Mount Everest point to these and other mysterious events as proof that benevolent beings are monitoring us from this remote location. However, it's just as likely that these and similar events were the result of a lack of oxygen at the high altitudes, affecting the brain's perception but this cannot explain the object in Brescia's incredible images. But could there be a more earthly explanation? Scott Brando of UFOofInterest.org responded to the image by saying that he believed it was a bird flying over the base camp, as opposed to the peaks, as some have claimed. I don't believe anything that guy says. The perception is difficult with photographs, which explains why, to some, the object appears much further away, and consequently higher and larger than it actually is. Matthew Lofthagen of OuterPlaces.com added that it's also possible that the object is simply dirt on the lens, stating the following. This photograph, one of almost 500 taken at the time, is a phenomenally high-resolution image, 
With detail comes noise and an increased chance that the tiniest bit of dust or debris on the I camera lens is, could end up being captured in the picture. It's just an artifact. Other suggestions are potentially more sinister in nature. The summit of Mount Everest is actually divided between Nepal on the southern side of the autonomous region of Tibet, which is part of mainland China I mean, on the northern side. Have Some have claimed that, artifact, that the object resembles a USAF B-2 spirit stealth bomber viewed from an awkward angle or similarly, an RQ-4 Global Hawk unmanned aerial vehicle. Could it be that Brescia's unknowingly captured an image of a clandestine surveillance mission aimed at the Chinese, involving aircraft designed specifically to evade Chinese radar? Alternatively, it is possible that the aircraft was itself a Chinese stealth design being tested in the area or was monitoring military activity in neighboring India. Chinese aerospace has been making great strides in developing stealth technology in recent years and applying them to aircraft, which has led to claims that Chinese hackers stole the technology from US computers. China has been at odds with India over the Kashmir region for decades and has also been observing India's increasing ties with the United States with suspicion. Given the passage of time, Transformer and the fact that no firm explanation for the object can be given. It's likely that it will become a source of speculation for many years to come. It's an astronaut committing suicide by jumping from space. Probably. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to Destination I love how they make such a huge deal out of Your this, number right? one it's source like for UFO, alien, Obviously an artifact. Videos. It's on one frame. Thanks for watching. And as always, you think so? In the, next the guy didn't notice anything about it when he was taking the videos. You know, like you know, if you're looking through your lens, you're probably gonna notice something if it's flying around. I call BS. I don't believe that for a second. No, oh, but if it's supersonic, you're not gonna see it in more than one frame. Uh, what if? There's, okay, there's not enough to go off of, man. I mean, it's a leap to be able to say, oh yeah, obviously. Cassie, that is a UFO base. On the well, you're a tough customer, Joel, but what if it's not exactly a UFO base? What if it is a military installation up there? Hold on. Hold on. What if the military is conducting spy operations or possibility Possibly, I love uh, pronouncing it that way. Probably. It's possibly preparing for a first strike capability on China or North Korea. And what we're seeing there is an ultra secret Chinook helicopter banking to one side. And this is secret that it ha has high altitude capabilities. You know, I, ballpark. I would much rather, you know, go with that possibility that it's something that think about it. China, it's right on the Chinese border. It's right on their back door. And that's why it's a spy drone or something. That's yeah. If, if it's anything, if it's not an artifact, it's either that or it's an artifact. That's what I'm, I'm thinking, Joel. I'm thinking it really could be a stealth bomber because if you hit it right at that angle there. What do you think, guys? If it's a stealth bomber, or if it's a hot air balloon, or a warm air balloon, or a weather balloon, if you think it's a balloon or related to something having to do with the it's balloon. It's a deflating balloon. It's one of those black balloons that they have at kids' birthday parties. And then the air just slowly came out of it, and so it went even higher. Our ghost line is open if you want to discuss why governments keep building secret bases. Give us a call. By the way, if you work at this secret base and you're ready to come clean, if you're about to commit suicide, you're sitting at your workstation in front of the video monitors, you're about to blow your brains out because of the guilt, what you're doing, the clandestine operations that you have been a part of, give us a call first. And fill your guts. So that's full confession. 773-669-6452. Give us a call, and you can spill it on li live on air on the air of the Shadowcast. Don't spill it live on the air. Tell us why you did it. Tell us why you did it. Whistleblower is welcome. 
and then you can support us on Patreon. Then you can commit suicide by jumping off the top of Mount Everest. Just don't do it. Flying down. Top. Yes, you will die, but just imagine soaring through the air like a bird. It'll be 10 minutes before you hit the ground, and you and will go on the greatest ride of your life. You can fight it with us and our audience. And it'll just be a, a you'll a, be flying like Jesus. Imagine it. It'll be the greatest moment of your life. Yes, the the um the cost is huge that you will hit the ground like a pancake. But just the think of burst. those five minutes of being like a flying squirrel. You're basically the king of the world. No one can stop you. Not even bullets can hit you because you're flying at top speed. Live stream that on a Wi-Fi GoPro if you're gonna do that. Just saying. Look up the GoPro or just hold your phone in your hand. Mm -hmm. All the way down. Um, Tom, you look like the kind of guy that's experienced a glitch or two in life. I'm glitching right now. Oh, I think I'm a robot. It turns out I was Data the whole time. (laughs) Data from Star Trek. I just thought I was a person. Tom is an early model uh, synth, uh, one of the early model 2.0s. So he has a working digestive system. His uh, liver... I'm like Pinocchio. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, so, you know, he can tell you a thing or two about glitches in time because uh, his neural net is... Well, it's not susceptible to such things as the Mandela effect. So Tom gets to have the effect of living in multiple dimensions all at once, something I will be always jealous of, to be quite honest. The best dimension is the orange one just saying everything's orange yep just like your cat just you know take your cat with you yeah he likes to ride in the backpack (laughs) put on the backpack jump off mount everest take the cat with you except he has a little parachute he didn't tell you about well the joke's on you that's true so whistleblowers are welcome. Again, our phone number is 773. You know what, Tom? I think I will actually drop that in the uh, that live chat here so people can actually see it. 773-669. we got to come up with a jingle for this, too. 6452. Ta-da. Call in drunk. Tonight, we'll get your, your two cents on this. Tonight, we're going to be talking about our glitches in time and not just the chemically induced ones. But this is really rather strange, Cassie. I mean, look, think about it. I know you probably had some deja vu. Have you ever experienced a glitch where you've just lost some time? You're like, well, where did my afternoon Joel glitched right there when he called you Casey. It's true. He did. He's not the real Joel. In another timeline. <laughs> well. Anyway. He's going to pay for that later. Probably. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So beyond creepy. Got this video that we noticed called Glitches. Check this out. Snitches get stitches. Scary music. This guy's music guy is good. Like that. Across the world, people have been reporting weird slips or glitches in reality. People are jolted forward or backward in time. This is your time. Sometimes their pants fall down. Some people even describe encountering themselves, sometimes older and sometimes younger. How drunk Just were they? Just such a case happened to a fellow named Brandon Thompson in Northern California. Or was it Thompson Brandon? The Yuba Sutter one day. Yuba. There, in the middle of country nowhere, is one of those four-way stoplights. It makes you wonder why the heck they put it there. Anyway, after the stop, as I was heading northbound, my attention focused on a Ford Galaxy that had stopped in the opposite direction. Both of us slowly accelerated from the stop. As I looked at the car, I recognized one, my uncle in the passenger seat, my aunt with her flaming red hair, and lastly, though, I didn't get to see very long, me in the back seat of this Galaxy. I pulled over on the other side of the intersection, got out, and looked at the car disappearing into the distance. Not like poof, but normal-like. I just saw myself, aunt, and my uncle 30 years ago. I had a mind to go after it, but something told me not to. A gut feeling. Seeing that was a treat in itself. 
I was blown away and still am. Looking back at that one experience, one thing that was not normal was the interior of the car was dark. Hard to explain. While it's entirely possible the witness encountered three very similar looking people in a similar car as to the one they drove in 30 years earlier, and that caused him to think he was seeing into the past. However, there are numerous such cases that exist that cause me to wonder if Brandon actually saw what he believes he saw. In my video, Arrival Apparitions, I discussed a case in which a man claims he encountered himself at a gas station. Interestingly, also in that case, the witness felt uneasy about actually attempting to interact with himself, unsure of what would happen. In Northern Ireland, a man named Richard had an equally bizarre encounter, one that spilled out into the street and into pure strangeness as he soon realized the man he was chasing was himself. This account appeared on a July 24, 2015 episode of Midnight in the Desert. Back in the 80s, mid-70s, I was earning more money than I probably should have for a person my age. So I was in the bar one night being the center of attraction and I was at the bar buying everyone drinks, everyone in the bar. A guy popped me in the back of the head and ran. <laughs> well, my hackles got up it. and I run after this guy, what I was going to do to him. And I run and I run and no matter how hard I run, I couldn't catch this guy. And at the very end of the block, two blocks up, he turned around and he looked at me and this guy had white hair and black glasses. I was in my twenties. I had bright red hair, but there was a familiarity about this guy. But now I'm 57 and now I have pure white hair, and black rim glasses. I don't know if it was my subconscious or a warning or something or from something. the future warning me about my behavior. I knew there was a familiarity well, what threw me was the white hair and black glasses because I never imagined myself having that look. But now I look at myself in the mirror and I know exactly who it was. I'm 57. The exact image of the person that I chased that night. Again, was it merely a coincidence or had the man actually encountered an older version of himself? In 1987, a man named Joe was standing outside a gas station in Maplewood, Missouri, waiting for a friend when he had a fleeting glimpse of another time. All of a sudden, everything got quiet. No traffic noise, nothing. I could see everything around me had changed. The power lines, the gas station, then everything scrambled. Sound came back, everything was back to normal. I stood in the same spot 10 years later, Mandela and I saw there. in real time what I had seen 10 years before. In another instance, a couple parked outside a CVS store saw time repeat itself in an extraordinary way. Hmm. My husband and I had parked outside a CVS and were crossing the road to go there. As we stepped onto the road, there was a bicyclist who was in front of us just outside the building. He passed by, left to right, about 10 feet away. No biggie. But by the time we reached the walkway, the same bicyclist was to our left, and he had slowed down to let us pass. I gestured to him to go ahead, and he did. There were no other people around. So in essence, there was a few seconds jump back in time, and the bicyclist crossed in front of us twice. I have Very interesting. cases in my video, Distorted Realities, in which people found themselves in another place, possibly a future or past setting, only to blink back into their present day. A trip to a local Home Depot in the summer of 2012 would forever change a man's life. In the summer of 2012, the simple trip to Home Depot changed the way I look at reality forever. I have been thinking about the details of that event ever since. A friend of mine and I decided to put up a tile backsplash in my kitchen one weekend. Saturday morning, at about 9 a.m., I went to Home Depot, 20 minutes away, to pick up a tile cutter for the job. When the witness returned home, he found his friend was very angry. When asked why, the friend informed him that he had been gone for over eight hours. <laughs> said, That's impossible. That and that I had been gone maybe an hour. I explained because I, I was able to pick up the said. tile cutter almost instantly, hopped in my car and left. Standing there in the kitchen 
I looked at my watch, which was stopped at 9.43 a.m. The clock on the microwave said 5.17. I then looked at and showed him the store receipt to prove when I checked out, it said 9.40 a.m. For the life of me, I can't account for the missing seven or so hours. In 1997, Steve McGill had an eerie experience when he decided to follow his girlfriend back to her place. I was dating a girl at the time, and she and I were at my mom's house. I can't remember what we were doing there, but after a while, my girlfriend said she would go back up home in her own car, about eight miles north from my mom's house, and I could follow her back when I was done at my mom's. I was going to stay and chat with my mom for a while, but I was tired and decided not to, so said goodbye to my mom and got into my own car. Now, it was no more than 30 seconds to a one-minute gap between my girlfriend leaving and me leaving, so I expected to catch up to her on the motorway very quickly. There was only one way back home. However, as I traveled, I could not see her car. For some childish reason, I was only 21 at the time, I gained speed to close the gap and soon found myself doing nearly 90 miles per hour in a bid to catch her. Mile after mile, my speed rose to over 110 miles per hour, but there was still no sign of her. I began to think she had taken a longer detour, or even popped into a shop or something, so I let off the gas a bit back to near 80 miles per hour, as I knew she couldn't possibly still be in front of me, as she was quite a moderate driver and never broke the speed limit. How wrong I was. To my absolute shock and amazement, when I pulled up at her house, not for one minute expecting her to be there, her car was there. Not only that, but she had time to call into the local fish and chip shop for tea and was busy plating it up for us for our evening meal. I have since worked out that she would have had to have had traveled at 200 miles per hour to get back in time for her to have done what she did. In 1971, Glenn Jones saw something bizarre in the skies of Clare and Suffolk. I was working as a chef in the village of Clare, Suffolk. Traveling one night between 11.30 p.m. and midnight on the back road from Cavendish to Foxhart, a very rural location, I became aware of a low droning sound. I stopped the car on a right-hand curve by a field got out and stood on the edge of the field. The night sky was filled with World War II bombers. Hmm. I could see more than 30 flying, spaced out. I was not. In the same direction, and it was their prop engines producing the noise. I don't recall whether or not they showed any lights. During World War II, this part of eastern England was peppered with airfields from where the bombing raids against Germany were launched. If they didn't have lights, how would you see it? It was maybe one of the thousand bomber raids forming, which would have taken place maybe 30 or so years prior to my sighting. It goes without saying that by the 1970s, there would only have been a handful of these planes still airworthy, and they would have been spread about around the world. The fear of ridicule has meant that I have kept this largely to myself, but the utter strangeness of it has never left me. I was neither under the influence of alcohol or drugs. I am pretty level-headed and have not had any other inexplicable sightings before or since. In another instance, a man recalls a time he inexplicably jolted forward in time or went to another place altogether. This account appeared on a December 21st, 2016 episode of Darkness Radio. This incident occurred in 2013. The witness recalled receiving a letter in the mail informing him that he had to be to court for jury duty. This included the date and the time. As he had already performed jury duty, he knew what to expect. The date was set for noon. It was on a Wednesday. The days passed and I had that date and time in the back of my head. I began preparing for it, telling my boss I needed the day off, etc. Tuesday night came around and I was prepared. Wednesday morning, I was counting the minutes until I had to leave. 11.25 a.m., I had to leave at that time because it was a 20-minute ride to the courthouse. I should be there at about 11. This guy does one thing a day. 
Eleven twenty prepares for it. I head out the door in my old Mustang. Everyone else just throws those letters in the trash. Man, so you know. call his wife, but for some reason, could not get a signal. This would be the first of many strange things to come. About twenty minutes later, I got to the courthouse, where I had previously had jury duty, and no one was there. It was eerily quiet. It was a like Saturday. if everyone had gone to lunch or something. I was shocked. Did I miss jury duty? It was a surprise birthday party. At the time on my phone, and it said 12:50 p.m. I stood there staring at my phone in disbelief. How was it 12:50? I thought to myself. I was in shock. From there, the witness left the courthouse and went back to his car. It was daylight savings at time. time. At the time on the radio's clock read 12:53 p.m. When he attempted to start his car, it wouldn't start. The car was completely dead. Turning the key in the ignition, it only clicked. Stepping out of his car, he popped the hood to have a look. Just then, a police officer pulled up next to him and offered to give him a hand getting his car started. I was still kind of stunned and said, yeah. So he said, I'll just come out and see what I can do. I just have to go punch in. It's almost 1 o'clock, right? I was shocked that the cop acknowledged that it was almost 1 p.m. I check my phone again, and yes, it's almost 1. So he goes into the station to punch in, and I keep fiddling with my car for a while. As he's heading back out, when I go to start my car, the engine roars to life. He waves at me, noting my car had started, and I leave. Halfway home, I call my wife, and the call actually goes through. I tell her about the bizarre series of events I just went through, and I ask her, what time is it? She says, it's 12.20, hon. I check my phone, and yes, indeed, it was 12.20 noon. I look over at the time on the radio, and it's 12.20. I don't have any explanation how I went one hour into the future, then returned to my timeline. If the cop hadn't confirmed the time, I would have just blamed a faulty phone. The world is a strange place. Maybe two guys thought it was the wrong time. What do you think, Cassie? That's pretty creepy. It's know. beyond creepy. I don't know. I just feel like playing devil's advocate tonight because there are a few things that could probably account for that. Explain. Well, the people could have been severely messed up and troubled individuals with a tremendous drug habit. You don't think the druggies miss time all the time? I mean, just... I'm sure they do. Sure. You know, maybe he was... Maybe he just doesn't want to admit that he was back behind the courthouse dumpsters huffing paint for four hours. They were high on helium. really boring. They were inhaling balloons. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I think I'd rather believe the uh, UFO alien base than this one. Well, Joel, this one is hard to get your arms around, but it's not beyond. were these isolated incidences? Well, I suppose they're isolated incidents. But if they were one-time occurrences, perhaps it would be easier to dismiss them. It could perhaps, but we'll this, say there's a chance that if it's legit, that it was obviously a wrinkle in time where different dimensions are intersecting yeah. through something strange. That, there's been many, many anecdotal reports of time looping, which is something at first you may have the reaction of not wanting to believe that, but a lot of people, including an antidote that was shared with me personally about eight years ago. It ironically also happened in a bar. Um, there was a guy I was talking to and this fellow told me about an incident that happened and he seemed so genuine when he was telling me this. He said that he was driving down the road it was after work and he was driving down the road and he saw a big tin pickup 
A tick up? Yes, he saw one of those tick ups. He saw an old style Big Ten pickup truck. And he was driving about 40 miles an hour and he was kind of marveling at it because you just don't see those very often. Not many of them still on the road. And he remembered that it, that was exact same as his dad's work truck. Same color. It was light brown. And then it had light beige racing stripes on it. And he was remembering um, how his dad and him would, would do work, would load up branches and things into the truck and then take it to the dump and as he was passing by this truck on the road at about 40 miles an hour he saw his dad driving it he told me this he saw his dad driving it but and his dad is still alive he's um he actually still lives in the same town as him but it was the circa like 1982 version of his dad and in the passenger seat was a little boy that looked just like him and he had his shirt off and at that moment he remembered a day where him and his dad had gone out to the county dump which was down that road and because it was so hot and they and his shirt was so dirty he took it off in the truck and it was only for about a second and a half. It was like a split second thing that he saw his dad and the young version of himself. And he was shocked. He was telling me and some other people about this. And I kind of had the same reaction that you're having to watch in this video that I was thinking, maybe there was a guy that just really looked like his dad and he was in this truck and maybe, as suggested at the first of the video, look, there's two possibilities I'm thinking right now. There is some phenomenon in which you see a very specific vehicle or something like that that triggers memory. And then you have an associative process where subconsciously your mind is looking to... I mean, some guy has the same haircut as one of your relatives or something, and you're putting the pieces together mentally. And if it's been a long day, you're tired, maybe you've been in the sun, you have heat exhaustion, you're putting it all together that way. I can, you know, it's very easy, I think, to file that under, you know, your mind is playing tricks with you. Option B. But I, I also definitely hold out that, you know, you can't have glitches in the matrix. Well, Joel, I have to share with you another account that I heard actually here on YouTube. I was watching a YouTube video where there was people giving testimony on a radio program where they were somewhere in the San Francisco or Oakland area, and they had friends that were visiting, I'm wanting to say from like Atlanta, where they invited their friends to come visit them. And they were talking on the phone and they're like, we're coming, we're coming to visit. Well, they get off the phone with them. It's about two hours later, they're on the front door. And the people are bewildered and they're like, how, and like, what's, what's the joke here? Were you at the, were you like here in town and you were, and they're like, what are you talking about? And the people, they're just at a complete loss because the people that came to see them insisted that they had been driving for two days and then the people whose house are standing there they said we were on the phone with you two hours ago and they're like no we've been drop we've been driving across country and the people and they had both of the people that were testifying to this and they say we have no idea what happened but there is a time of there's a time distortion that has happened here and they feel that there is some time anomaly that occurs. It seems to occur in pockets or in particular places or circumstances. I'm not real clear on it. The thing is about something like that that's happening is how do you look for it and how do you find it? How do you verify it and how do you classify it? There's been a lots of stories like this, but where do you begin? Look, if you're someone that is wanting to, 
we might be 200 years away from scientists even taking the time to begin to even think about how to go about trying to examine something like that. What would you do? Well, what did we learn tonight, Tom? We learned that if you see a little man walking out of a spaceship and he's coming down a ladder, well... Just grab him. Yes, yes. Throw him in your backpack. Make him jump on the motorcycle and take off. Waterboard him. Make him talk. Well, just just go on a... Just say, hey, hop on the back of the motorcycle. We'll go... We'll go for a boogie ride. Be great. That's how you. And then no, he says, yes. if that does happen to you, that you just keep your mouth shut because they ruined that guy's life over that. Someone who is otherwise known as being a very honest, honest, honest. He was very honest. Well, it sounded honest. like it sounded like at first he was trying to joke it off. He was like, "Yeah, I was a little green man." And then when one of his fellow officers sat down with him and he was like, "Look, I'm trying to take you seriously. What what happened?" He was like. All right, it was a little man, but he wasn't green. He was he was like gray. Or he said that he was kind of kind of human looking, but also small, 12 year old or something. Child size and very strange. That's how the gray aliens or the little men, whatever you want to call them, are described as being very peculiar in their actions and their behavior. I also think it's notable that it wasn't a combative interaction, which is um, something very notable. Many of these encounters with spaceships and the occupants that come out is that it's not hostile. And it seems almost like a police officer in that moment, you would imagine them to react defensively, but these officers didn't immediately have their defensive response, which they're trained for. And instead, it seemed almost to be a disarming situation where the officer didn't interrogate the little man and also didn't try to prevent him from getting away. Uh, and there's also a UFO base up there. So uh, you can get two birds at once. Free tent. You know, I think. Jump off the top. It'll be the nice greatest well. moment of your life. You'll be famous. Live stream with CNN as you're flying through the air off Mount Everest. Cassie, thank you for being our guest, and please return again soon. Oh, I had a great time. Thank you for having yes, me. Yes, yes. We hope you can come back next week. Can't wait. Can't wait. All right, guys. Well, we want to thank you again for tuning in. It's been a blast. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you see an alien, uh, pull out the rocket launcher. Rocket launcher. <laughs> Well, the pen on the grenade. Give him hell. You know, basically, if I ever do see one, I'm going to pull a GTA 5, and I'm going to jack their ship. I'm going to pull them out of it, and I'm going to take it for myself, and I'm going to, yeah. Do a lethal weapon where you knock open the gas line on the stove and then wait for them to come in, and then you sit there with a lighter in your hand. It'd be awesome. And you say, boom goes the dynamite. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks for being with us tonight. It's been fun. Tom? Yeah. Easy, man. If you see any aliens, let us know. All right. We'll All right, see guys. you next time. <laughs>